pleased to welcome you all here to the uh, first year seminar lecture, which will be given by Coach Smallwood. And uh, introducing Coach Smallwood today will be our provost, Dr. Shirley Williams, who will come up just as soon as I'm finished. Um, one thing I wanted to let you know is that at the end of Coach's lecture, there will be a period of time for you to ask him questions. Um, and the way we'd like to do this so that we can keep it orderly is that there will be four Alvarez students in the audience with microphones. And if you have a question for Coach, just raise your hand. We'll have a student come right over to you with the microphone. You can stand up using the microphone so everybody can hear your question, and uh, we'll be able to get the question and answer in the best way that way. So again, thank you very much for being here tonight, and uh, I'd like to introduce Provost Shirley Williams. Well, Jay asked you to take your cell phones out of your pockets and silence them. I would ask you to put them back in your pockets and not look at them. You can do it for an hour, it really won't work. But anyway, thank you, Jay. You know, there are about 160 miles between Rodale Institute's farm and Max County Township, not far from our campus, and the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. So at a pace of about 10 miles a day, stopping along the way to speak with farmers and business owners and about sustainable gardening, it took Coach Mark Smallwood more than half of October to walk there. And you complain when you have to walk from Upland to Francis Hall. Oh well, it's a pretty impressive pace and an equally impressive goal. Of course, I do wonder how much time he spent scouting out basketball courts along the way. He told me that he had a lot of individual conversations and that it was a really interesting experience, about 16 days actually. Coach was on a mission to deliver a research paper to the Secretary of Agriculture and members of Congress and to lobby for organic agriculture. According to the research, increased use of organic agriculture could significantly decrease greenhouse gases in our planet's atmosphere by taking carbon out of the air and putting it back into the ground where it belongs. Our local Berks County area has more than 1,100 farms, but many use harmful petroleum-based fertilizer instead of compost. Research shows that regardless of farm operation, whether it be conventional or organic, there are methods for farmers to improve their soil and help the environment. Coach calls this regenerative agriculture, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it tonight. Rodale's research is just one new beginning towards a better tomorrow, but the overall concept of sustainability is gaining increased understanding and commitment in America and here at Alvernia. Last March, we asked Alvernia students and faculty what they thought about sustainability, and the vast majority of the survey's participants said that environmental sustainability was the most important component of sustainability. Inspired by the survey and a visit to the Rodale Institute Experimental Farm, an Alvernia student initiative called the Bog Turtle Creek Farm was launched this spring at the university's off-campus sports park. Things got off the ground, or I guess out of the ground, quickly. Holler and Center volunteers planted and maintained vegetables at the new farm all season long and sold them at Penn Street Market, the only inner city farmer's market that accepts food stamps. It was a great start for this student-led project designed to grow a sustainable garden and supply fresh produce to city families, particularly low-income families who need to use government programs to purchase food. And others saw the project's potential as well. Friends of the Reading Hospital, Burke's Agricultural Resource Network, Georgie Mushrooms, Leon Neiman, AmeriCorps Vista, they all helped. So several students could manage and sell crops over the summer. Aladdin Food Services bought vegetables for use in the school's cafeteria, and others in the, in the university community purchased shares to support the project receiving weekly deliveries of produce grown at the garden. Alvernia students are learning about sustainable ideas in other ways as well. 
In May, students in the Sustainable Communities course flew to the Dominican Republic where they worked on a much needed water filtration system for barrio residents. At the direction of their professors, these students learned about the biology of water filtration and wrote grants to keep the project going after their class ended. A new minor in community and environmental sustainability establishes connections across many different disciplines and prepares students to incorporate sustainable thinking and practices into a variety of future careers. This minor also provides a natural link to the university's Master of Arts and Liberal Studies Community Leadership Program, emphasizing leadership for sustainable communities. And of course, biology professor Dr. Spence Stover has long been leading the charge for nature-centered leadership. Several graduate students are working both with Dr. Stover and on their own to foster a better understanding of environmental leadership. Be sure to mark your calendar to hear them speak on Earth Day 2015. So it is with great anticipation that we gather today to hear a champion of environmental sustainability, Coach Mark Smallwood, who has been dedicated to promoting organic agriculture, environmental stewardship, efficiency, and conservation for more than 30 years. He has also spent some time teaching in public schools and working the basketball court, as his name suggests. A longtime organic farmer and executive director of the Rodale Institute, Coach has been known to raise chickens, goats, sheep, pigs, honeybees, and I'm told has even driven his own team of oxen. He has launched a national campaign to, dream, to train a new generation of organic farmers and expanded research that showed viability of such techniques. So if you are passionate about the environment, open your ears and your hearts and offer a warm welcome to tonight's speaker, Coach Mark Smallwood. students here at Alvernia. I've, I've done a couple of uh, programs here in the past, and um, I will tell you, first of all, most importantly, that there's an open invite to any and all of you, even if it's all of you at the same time. Uh, we'd like to have you at the Rodale Institute. Come down and visit. It's a short ride from here, uh, less than an hour. Uh, we have 333 acres and lots of diversity. I think what we are most proud of is, is the fact that um, we are a working farm, but we have research components attached to everything that we do. So let me talk about something that is brand new, and you'll learn something uh, quickly, I think. How many of you are Teamsters? You've driven oxen. That's what I thought. So let me, let me give you a quick lesson on, on oxen driving. First of all, uh, you need to know what an oxen is. An oxen is any breed of cow. It has to be a male, it has to be castrated, and it has to work. So we use our oxen uh, to pull farming implements. We put them in a yoke. There's two of them at a time. Our oxen uh, right now, the two that we're using, their names are Lewis and Clark. <laughs> Just like the Rodale Institute, they are pioneering uh, when, when we use them to work. So any cow that is castrated and works is called, called an oxen. Any cow that's castrated and doesn't work is called a steer. And any cow that is what they call intact is a bull. So quick lesson. Uh, oxen are meant to go forward, they go backwards, they turn left, they turn right, but their very, very favorite thing to do is, whoa, that would be stop. So when you want to get oxen to move, you use a, a twitch, a, a stick or, or a wand, and you don't hit them with it, you, you touch them. So it's a tactile command, 
as well as a verbal command. So if I want my oxen to stop, that, that stick goes down. That's the brake. So that's the, that's the red light. So when they see the stick down in front of them, they stop. When I want them to move forward, I put the stick on my shoulder and the command is, get up boys. And so it's get up boys and that means walk straight ahead. My oxen that I drove back in Connecticut, their names were Boots and Socks. Boots is the nigh oxen, that's the one next to me. The oxen furthest away from me in the yoke is called the off oxen, so the nigh and the off. My nigh oxen in Connecticut loved to work. My off oxen didn't care for it too much. So for the first few months in training, we were always sort of turning left. People thought that I was doing creative plowing, and that really wasn't the case. We were just trying to get them to behave. So if I want them to turn left, I would take the, the wand, touch my off oxen on the face, touch my, I'm sorry, touch my nigh oxen on the face, touch my off oxen on the hind quarters. So I freeze this one, and I get the off oxen to move, and we go like a skid steer, we turn left. Turn right is the opposite. Touch that one on the face, this one in the hind quarter, and we get them to turn right. So we will be having uh, demonstrations at the farm this year. Uh, this coming spring, they'll be about 18 months old and ready to work. I bought the two oxen, uh, Lewis and Clark, from a dairy farmer next door to us. Two-day-old and three-day-old calves. And because they're males, they're not of much value to the dairy farmer, no milk. So I offered him $25 a piece, and he thought that was a great deal. So uh, we now have a team of oxen in training that will be worth about $5,000 when they're actually able to pull uh, implements. So a few years ago, I was uh, to give a uh, presentation like this, and my son and daughter were home from college, and they said, what are you going to talk about? I said, I'm going to discuss the disequilibrium created when two opposing paradigms clash. I call it shift happens. <laughs> so what exactly does that mean when two opposing paradigms clash? We're here really tonight to talk about something that we're all sort of trapped into. We all get hungry, and therefore that we all have to eat. So we're here tonight to talk about food. So let me give you a couple of paradigms and show you uh, what shift happens is all about. So here's a typical shopper. They go into a grocery store, they grab their cart, they walk the grocery store, they take food off the shelf, they put it in their cart, they take it home, they cook it and they eat it, and they trust it. And they don't ask any questions. That's one paradigm. The other paradigm would be people like myself. I take the cart, I walk the grocery store, and I ask lots of questions. When I buy chicken, I want to know where that chicken came from. I want to know the farmer's name. I want to know if whatever was outside. I want to know what the chicken ate. I wanted to know whether it had any other chicken friends. And of course the people in the store look at me like I'm very weird. And maybe I am, but that's my paradigm. And now do you understand what happens when those two paradigms meet? There's disequilibrium. And that's where we're at now in the state of the food system as it exists in the United States. And that's what we're here to talk about and, and make sure that you understand that there's two different paradigms going on in your food system today. Let me give you another example. I had a guy come to our farm in Connecticut and I was milking a goat. I had a beautiful white Toggenberg and her name was Sweetie. I had Sweetie in a stanchion and I was milking away and this guy came into my barn and he said, I hear you have the best chicken around. I said, I, I, I think I do, thank you. Um, I'll be with you in a minute, I'm, I'm busy. And he asked me the inevitable question, so what are you doing? It seems obvious, I'm on a stool and I have two teats in my hand. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm milking a goat. Would you like some raw goat's milk? And he said, no, 
I, I don't do that. And I said, okay, can I take a couple of minutes of your time and talk to you about the disequilibrium created when two opposing paradigms clash? Honestly. I said, I call it shift happens. <coughs> he said, okay, go ahead. So I told him the grocery shopping analogy and the two different paradigms. And I said, would you like a nice cold Coca-Cola? He said, yeah, that'd be great. I said, well, we don't do that. So I just set up the paradigms. I want to give him raw goat's milk, some of the finest food on the planet, and he wants ice cold, carbonated sugar water. Do you understand the two paradigms and how the disequilibrium was created? So I got him to try some goat's milk, and trust me, I'm not, I'm not that clever. Uh, he took a drink of it, and he put it down, and he said, wow, that's good shift. <laughs> so that's where we're trying to go tonight, to give you some examples of some paradigms that are out there, and how you might be able to create a shift in the current food system that we think is flawed, and I'm trying to be kind. I've been a beekeeper for 19 years, and every year beekeepers go out to look at their hives and investigate the health of the hive. You're looking for the queen bee, you're looking for uh, new eggs in the, in the hive in the springtime, and um, you usually have uh, frames inside the hive, and on each of these frames, there's about 2,000 bees. I pulled two frames out of a hive, and the frames were glued together. The bees use beeswax, and it's called bridge wax. And it's not good for those to be glued together. So I was working them apart, and purely by accident, I, I dropped one of the frames at my feet. So I have 2,000 bees at my feet. I have another 2,000 bees in my hand, and they are all communicating with one another. And I think the conversation goes something like, Who, who's the moron taking care of the hive today? This is not good. And so they go into the defensive mode and they begin to sting me. So I got stung on the neck a couple of times. I got stung on the arms. I put this frame back into the hive and I still had 2,000 bees on the ground. And it took me about an hour to get them back into the hive. And I reflected on what it was that the bees were teaching me this day. What was the lesson to learn? So what happens when a bee stings you? I'm not talking about a wasp or a hornet. I'm talking about a honeybee. You all know what happens. They put the stinger in and they fly off and what happens? They die. They only get one sting. And that was really the message that the bees were sending me. The message was that they were sacrificing themselves for the rest of their colony. They were sacrificing their life for the rest of the bees that lived in that hive. Get this person who's causing damage to us away. And that's how they did it, by sacrificing their lives. So I'm challenging you now to start to think about how you can sacrifice. You're freshmen, most of you, here at Alvernia, and you have an opportunity in the next four years to create some change and that can be done most oftentimes through making some sacrifices yourself. I, I heard that environmental sustainability was of the highest concern. So let's make a stance starting today because here's what I did. I got those other 2,000 bees back into the hive and I made a promise to myself that every day I would have a trigger that would say to myself, be a better steward for our hive. And our hive is called planet Earth. And so every day, I wear green. That's my trigger. I put green clothes on. I have lots of green clothes. I tell people at work, if you ever see me without green on, I'll give you $100. So I have a lot more green clothes than I have $100 bills. So every day I put on green. And then every day when I first step outside, I thank all of the plants and all of the animals that lived here before us, because that's why we're here now. So my challenge would be to you 
to develop a trigger for yourself to remind you to become a better steward and to remind you to start to work on this environmental sustainability issue here on your campus. So I talked to you briefly about uh, the Rodeo Institute, 333 acres, we're in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. We have a compost facility, we have greenhouse operations, we have 1,100 certified organic apple trees, we have high tunnels, we have hoop houses, we raise about 80 different varietals of vegetables, we raise small grains, corn, wheat, soy, oats, rye. We have livestock, including honeybees. We raise heritage breed animals, chickens, goats, sheep, pigs, and of course, uh, Lewis and Clark, our oxen team. Our founder, J.I. Rodell, was in poor health in 1940. 1940. He was not in agriculture, he was not a farmer. He made his money in hydraulics in New York City. He became very wealthy and moved to Pennsylvania and started a small farm operation, actually at Emmaus. But he was in poor health and he was concerned about how he might use food as medicine. And he began to investigate and do research and read a lot of information from the most famous agronomist and soil scientist in the world, Sir Albert Howard, Rudolf Steiner, Eve Balfour. And what he came to realize is that our system here in the United States in 1940 uh, had adopted the fertilizer of choice called ammonium nitrate. It was a chemical that dominated our food system. And 1940, as you might know, was the beginning of the height of World War II. And what they were doing was pulling ammonium nitrate off of the farms in our agricultural system, our food system, and putting it back into munitions. They were gonna make bombs out of the same fertilizer that were, they were putting on our food. And J.I. had two questions. Number one, why would they put something that you can make munitions out of on our food? That was a big question mark. But number two, what are we going to do now? Because they're removing that chemical. And so in his research and in his investigation, he was able to come up with a phrase that we still use today. He wrote it on a chalkboard in his office. Healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. And that is our mantra today, and that is part of the challenge that we're going to leave you with this evening. So there's two kinds of agriculture now in the United States and worldwide, but we'll, we'll just talk about what goes on here. Both of these systems use well-respected and very well-known sciences. One of them is called chemistry, and the other is called biology. And there's one that dominates our system right now. When I was down in Washington, D.C. to meet with the USDA, the Department, or the Secretary of Agriculture said to me, "There's yes, you're right, there are two kinds of agriculture here. There's one that's dominated by chemistry, and there's one that's dominated by biology. By biology. And, and they're like my children, I have to love them both. And I said to him, I understand that but one of them is a bully. The chemical system currently is dominated by genetically modified organisms, GMOs, chemical herbicides, pesticides, synthetic chemical fertilizers, and our animals live in what they call CAFOs, confinement animal feeding operations. So what's a GMO? Genetically modified organism. The two major GMO crops in the United States are corn and soybean. Currently, soybean represents, uh, I'm sorry, GMO soybean in the United States represents 94% of the soybean production. And how has it been genetically modified? Soybean has actually been, it, its DNA has been changed so that it is resistant to the herbicide called Roundup. 
It's a Monsanto product. It's a multi-billion dollar product from Monsanto. And they have devised what they call biotechnology. They have actually changed the DNA of the soybean so that when you spray Roundup on the weeds that appear in the soybean field, the weeds die, but the soybean does not. That product has been around for about 25 years. Genetically modified corn, they've injected into the DNA the ability of that corn to use BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a pesticide. When the corn earworm begins to gnaw on fresh corn, it dies because there's a pesticide embedded in the kernel of the corn. So my question would be to you, is, is that safe for us? When you shop in a grocery store, and this is a USDA piece of data, 75% of the products you buy in a grocery store contain genetically modified organisms. So it's one of those corn uh, products or soybean products. So it's a question and something for us all to consider. Animals that live in these CAFOs, they live with other animals, they live with their feed, they live with their manure, they live with their urine, they live with other dead animals. There are full-time jobs in some of the poultry operations for individuals that for eight hours a day, all they do is pick up dead chickens and dispose of them. I call those poultry prisons, pig prisons. Most of the pork that you buy in the grocery store today are pigs that may have never turned around in their whole life. I'm setting up one paradigm for you right now. The factory farm currently, worldwide, is responsible for 74% of the world's poultry. 43% of the world's beef comes out of these confinement operations. 50% of the world's pork out of confinement operations. 63% of the eggs out of confinement operations. Millions of layers in chicken houses that never flap their wings, that never turn around. And some of the eggs, no human being touches them until we open that package up in the store to make sure none of the eggs are broken. This is what we've been told, and this is what we've been sold. The industrial food complex is good for rural communities. It makes food that's cheap, healthy, efficient, and we're feeding the world. And what we know is that it's all wrong. Do you remember this past summer when they had to close down uh, parts of Lake Erie because of the disaster up in Toledo, Ohio? Anybody remember that? So there was an algal bloom because of runoff from agriculture right next to Lake Erie. Listen to the warnings that were posted. Don't drink the water. Don't let your children bathe in this water. And boiling it will increase the toxins. Here's what we're finding out on our farm. We have a trial that started back in 1981. It's called the Farming Systems Trial. We grow conventional crops, chemical production, right next to organic, side by side. It's the longest trial of its kind in the world, and we have some great information. Back in 2008, the agricultural community came to us, and they said, you're calling it conventional, but we don't grow that way anymore. All we do is GMO. All of our seed, corn and soy, is genetically modified. And so if you want to have credibility with the farming community in the conventional world, you need to grow GMOs here too. 
And so in 2008, we agreed and we started to grow GMO corn and soy in those trials. Two years, we found that the Roundup didn't work anymore on certain weeds. So we're, we're getting weed pressure even after we spray Roundup. The soy was still okay because it's resistant, but there were, there were weeds that they call super weeds. And so then we had to start spraying a second application, and we spray atrazine now. Atrazine is an endocrine disruptor. disruptor. It's a toxin. It's a poison. So we spray Roundup, we spray atrazine, and we're finding atrazine leach leaching into the groundwater all around us. And now atrazine doesn't work anymore. And so we have to go to a third application. We spray Roundup, we spray a toxic poison called atrazine, and now we're spraying what has just been allowed for more usage in the U.S., 2,4-D, the active ingredient in Agent Orange. That's how they're growing on the conventional side, corn and soy. So I'm setting up a paradigm for you, and one of them is on this side. It's the, it's the chemical production, and it's what is dominating our food system today. What we also found out was that this chemical production can be linked to climate change. How many think that climate change is real? Let me see your hands. Okay. So some of you don't feel like raising your hand or think that it's not real, one or the other. 97% of the climatologists worldwide have agreed that climate change is real and that there is a link of about 50% of the cause is chemical agricultural production. So climate change to me is really simple. It's historic weather events. Things that have occurred that people are scratching their head and saying, you know, we've never seen anything like this. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, a hurricane in the uh, Baja Peninsula. Listen to the date, September 2014. The strongest recorded storm ever to hit the Baja Peninsula. California, the worst drought on record. What year? 2014. Remember the polar vortex this past winter? Historical, winter of 2014. Some of you may have been around last May 2014 when the hailstorms hit here and did damage to vehicles and buildings, historical weather events. So I've painted one side of the story, one paradigm for you. Let's talk about what we feel is the solution. And we call it regenerative organic agriculture. We feel like we need to replace chemistry and we need to replace biotechnology. So Monsanto used to call themselves a chemical company. They call themselves a biotech company now. There used to be a company out there called Chemlon. It was a lawn care company. It's called True Green now. Same company, just a different name. Same with Monsanto. It's still a chemical company. They call themselves a biotech. So we want to grow with biology. We want to grow where there's life in the soil. Because we understand and we have great data that says when you grow with life in the soil, so too does that food have life. So if you were to come to the Rodale Institute and take a handful of our regenerative organic soil, you would be confident in saying that there are more microorganisms in your hand than there are human beings on the face of the earth. That's how we want to grow. We want to grow next to nature. We want to grow where there's life underfoot. 
So organic, and in particular regenerative organic agriculture, we feel is the other paradigm. And when we set these two up, you know that there's disequilibrium created because it's a little scary to think about the way our food is being produced and what's dominating our food system right now. But we want to talk about the good and the merits of organic. The word regenerative to us means that we leave behind better than what we found. So for our farm, for example, our farm is a better farm today than it was yesterday, every day. Our challenge at the end of the evening will be to say to you, can you make Alberta a better campus today than it was yesterday, every day? So we grow with tried and true biological methods. We rely on the microbes in the soil for nutrient exchange. We don't rely on water-soluble chemical fertilizers that if the plant can't use it, it either off-gasses into the atmosphere or flushes down into the groundwater. We use bacteria, fungi, nematodes, microarthropods, the true biology that's alive in that soil. The four tenets of organic farming are compost, crop rotation, cover crops, and reduced tillage. We try not to till unless it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> Certified organic meat, eggs, and dairy products, all of those animals have to be fed a 100% certified organic diet. Very strict and, and stringent uh, regulations. I mentioned the farming systems trial and I want to tell you a couple of other things that we found out. Always the question to us is, organic's great, it sounds wonderful, yes it's good for the environment, yes it's healthier for humans, uh, yes it's growing with nature, cover crops and so on, that's all good news, but can organic feed the world? So here's what we know after 33 years of good science and good data, not three years, not 13 years, 33 years, we know that the conventional crops and the organic crops in terms of yield are the same after 33 years. There's not a scientist in the world that would dispute that information. So when the pundits say that organic can't feed the world, if it's based on yields, then neither can they. And if they can feed the world, and it's based on yields, then so can organic. The difference, the big difference is, the regenerative, regenerative part. We improve the soil on our farm every day and every year. It's better than it was last year, every year. So let me tell you about organic matter quickly and another piece of data that came out of this trial. When we first did baseline studies on the soil, we had 0.9% organic matter, or carbon, 0.9% throughout the whole entire trial. 33 years later, the conventional trial beds, when we take soil samples, it's still 0.9%. It's flatlined in terms of carbon and organic matter. On the organic sites, it's between 5 and 6% organic matter. So we've done five times better in the organic trials than we have in the conventional. So the yields are equal. We're building soil. We use about 45% less energy because of, we don't use the petroleum-based inputs. And we actually outperform conventional crops in issues of drought, up to 31% uh, in our best year. So we outperformed the GMO crop from Monsanto that was said to be drought resistant. We beat them by 31% in yield. The economic analysis is also very bright. We're earning $835 per acre compared to $495 per acre, organic versus conventional. So quickly, I want to talk about our, our quest.
request to bring regenerative organic agriculture as an answer to this issue of climate change. We want to use organic agriculture to produce food for all of you because we know it's going to be healthier food. So it's healthy soil, it's healthy food, and our ultimate goal is healthy people. So we're trying to work our way out of a job. When we have global human health, our job is done, and we'll move on to another topic. And I think job security is pretty safe currently. If we can manage all cropland, this is globally, and, and make that shift, to regenerative organic agriculture. We can draw down 40% of the annual carbon emissions. If we can convert global pastures to regenerative organic agriculture, we can draw down 71% of the current emissions. So if you do the math, 40 plus 71 is more than 100. So we're not talking about mitigating global climate change, we're talking about reversing it. We can actually take up 100% of the current emissions and then tip the needle past 100 and begin to draw down the excesses. Right now, carbon in the atmosphere is at 400 parts per million. Nature would tell us that 350 parts per million is good balance. We're in a safe place. At 400, and drawing those numbers backwards, 399, 398, that's our goal with regenerative organic agriculture. So now do you see the paradigm of what regenerative means? It's actually making it better each year, tipping that needle again past 100%. So we're raising all of our livestock on pasture, not in CAFOs. We're raising animals that were bred to live on pasture. Animals that are in decline now because they didn't make it in those confinement operations. So you'll see uh, a breed called large black pigs, for example. They're easily recognizable. They're large and they're black. Uh, our boar hog, is, uh, his name is Houdini. Uh, he's, he's sired now um, five litters this past year. Uh, we plan to raise about 100 hogs this year at the farm, and we're creating models for other small farmers to raise animals on pasture and to raise heritage breeds so that those animals live the way nature meant them to live. Pigs have a rooting instinct. They like to dig with their nose, and we allow them to do that. We encourage it. We have about seven different heritage breed chickens, both layers and birds for meat that are called broilers. We have a dairy operation on the farm now, 65 head dairy that get milked twice a year. Um, we have goats that are bred currently. Uh, we should be having baby goats uh, within the next couple of days, and our sheep are being bred uh, this week. So this was part of my introduction. This is our report. This is our study. It shows that regenerative organic agriculture not only is good for the soil, and not only is the paradigm that we have to shift our food system into, but it's also the answer to reversing climate change. Not lessening, reversing it. Here's the most important part of the report. It's the last three and a half pages. This is all the research. This is not an op-ed, this is not my opinion. This is good science, deep science, and, and real data that the USDA sits up and listens to. So when we, we, when we created the report, we had some meetings. Uh, we went to the climate march in New York City. Anybody attend that back in September? Just a few people. 400,000 people in New York City marching uh, on the UN. And after the march was over, a couple of days later, everything went dark and everything
everything went silent. And we sat around at the Institute and we said, okay, well, you know, what's happening? What are people doing? And the answer was clearly nothing. And so I decided to do something. And so on October 1st, I started walking from Kutztown, Pennsylvania, 162 miles to Washington, D.C., to hand deliver our report to the USDA. I remember meeting some animals along the way that, that greeted me and, and gave me energy uh, to continue. I remember coming across the Susquehanna River from, from Lancaster County into York County and being greeted by the county commissioner, river keepers, organic farmers. And the county commissioner shook my hand, introduced himself, and the first thing he said to me was, Coach, there's atrazine in the spawning beds of the smallmouth bass right there, and it's coming out of conventional agriculture. We need your help. And, and he agreed to collaborate with us. I remember meeting moms across America, women who have children with uh, various kinds of food allergies and disorders that they are relating backwards to the food that they eat. I met one small child, four-year-old, that looked like he was two. He was in a stroller. He couldn't walk. He was very listless. And the only thing that he could stomach were bananas. That's the only food he eats. So his mother is buying banana chips and making banana flour, trying whatever she can do. And she said, I, I, I sit at home and, and I, I just, I cry. I don't know what to do. And, and this, this walk is giving me hope. Somebody's doing something about it. And so we've, we've taken it a, a little step further. So listen to the letters, Regenerative Organic Agriculture. It's R-O-A, and we've changed the words around a little bit. We're calling it Regenerative Organic Agricultural Revolution. So we've added an R onto the end. So what do we have? Roar. Roar. So we would like to introduce tonight uh, <laughs> Roar Alvernia. I would like to offer to you an opportunity to collaborate with the Rodeo Institute and begin to look and make assessments as to what's happening on your campus that maybe is in a paradigm that could be shifted and, and shifted to a place where this environmental stewardship becomes high priority. So are you asking questions about your food? Is the food good here? No. I would, I would guess that most college campuses, it's the same answer. Are you composting your food waste? I already know the answer, no. Have you looked at removing all of the toxic chemicals out of the systems that are in place here on campus? You realize that I could take all of your toxic cleaning products off this campus and replace them with organic alternatives. That's my promise, but I'm not gonna do it for you. You have to take a leadership role. And here's what happens. Here's what happens when you take a leadership role. You open yourself up for criticism, but just be prepared. Are there other opposing paradigms that exist on this campus that you think you could shift? And is food maybe the place where we could get started together? And so my challenge would be to all of you, how can you leave this planet a better place today than it was yesterday, every day? And here's really what this is all about. There's going to be one question and two potential answers. So the question is going to come from 
generations after us. Your children, your grandchildren, when they look back on all of you, they're going to ask what it was, that the legacy that you left behind. What did you leave and how did you leave it from the way that you found it? So the question goes like this. So were, were you involved in all of that? And one of the answers is this. Yes, I was. I'm very sorry. We blew it. I'm heartbroken. We missed our chance. Or the question will be, so were you involved in all of that? And their answer will be, you're damn right I was. So proud to say. I remember when the light bulb went on for me. It was my freshman year at Alvernia. And I heard this guy coach and he, he, he woke me up to the fact that I really can accomplish things previously thought to be impossible. And I did it for all of you. Thank you, everybody. So I hope you have some questions. There's one. So is it true that organic food tends to be more expensive than inorganic food? It depends upon how you look at that. So is organic food more expensive? I can tell you that it depends on where you shop and how you shop. Um, in general, it's, uh, there's about a 10% um, higher cost to organic food. The issue would be that if you look at the real cost of organic food, it's actually cheaper. Organic food doesn't contribute to the environmental impacts that conventional food does. And there's no cost attached to cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay, for example, or cleaning up that atrazine that's in the spawning beds of the smallmouth bass in the Susquehanna. They don't, they don't contribute to that, and so there should be no cost attached to that. And on my walk, we stopped at multiple grocery stores because that's the question that I get asked all the time as well. So there's a very simple economic uh, answer to it. It's called supply and demand. Right now there's more demand than there is supply. And so there is a cost attached to that because they can charge a premium, and they do. But every single produce manager that we talked to on, on the walk said that the prices are now competitive. Uh, nowhere near what they used to be, and that you can buy organic uh, sometimes at a lower cost, depending upon what week it is and what product you're buying. So how can you tell, because here's another question that everybody asks, how can you guarantee, how can you tell, and how can you trust that what you buy is organic? And it's the USDA seal. Trust the seal. If you see it on the product, it's organic. You can trust it. And in produce in particular, uh, you know the little uh, stickers that they put on apples and the uh, UPC codes that they use? If the number on the produce starts with nine, then it's organic. If it starts with any other number, put it back on the shelf, go find the produce manager and tell them that you want the organic version of whatever it is that you, you put back. And here's how stringent the rules are. If I have an organic apple here with the number nine on it, I have a conventional apple here, let's call it honey crisp. If I touch those two apples together, I just contaminated the organic apple. I have to put it down and change the sticker on it and I can't sell it as organic. That's how strict the rules are on the, again, on the organic side. So the number nine is really critical. Yes. When you said 
you milk the cows twice a year? Did you actually mean that? Where are you? Did I say twice a year? Yes. Oh, it's twice a day. I'm sorry. Twice a year, those cows would be in big trouble. Sorry. That was a mistake. I did mean twice a day. Yes, this question. You mentioned the genetic engineering that's taking place with soy and corn. Can you also speak to what is happening with wheat? Because there are so many people now that seem to have gluten intolerances. I've read that it's genetically engineered, that consequently because of what is happening with the breads that we eat, the whole grains supposedly are not as good as they say they are, and that um, it's contributing to many of our um, issues with weight loss. Sure, so uh, I'm sure we have gluten-free folks in the audience, right? Um, that's something that's brand new. That's another one of those, what I call a historical event, something that did not happen 30 years ago, 25 years ago. So they are attempting to genetically modify wheat. They are already, they've already done sugar beets. They've already done canola. They've already genetically modified cotton. And they're attempting to create more gluten in the wheat germ because you don't have to use as much yeast. The, the dough, when they're making bread, rises more quickly and it speeds up production and lowers the cost of production. So again, that's really the bottom line for everything that they're doing on this side of that paradigm is they're, we always like to say that they're trying to, that the, the conventional egg is trying to grow as much food as they possibly can for the least amount of money. Organic farmers are trying to grow the highest quality food, period. Forget cost, we don't worry about that. But in terms of gluten, they are trying to raise the amount of gluten in the wheat because of uh, saving costs on, on production and, and the cost of, of yeast. And there are lots of now yeast intolerant folks uh, across the country. So there's gluten-free products now those are relatively new. That's the more question. I have a question. Uh, have you looked into any, since this is Pennsylvania and we're in the Marcellus Shale region, have you looked into all the water pollution created from fracking from northern Pennsylvania all the way down through the Marcellus Shale? The water table is being polluted, am I correct? And that has an effect on our local agriculture here. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, my thought is that I totally agree with you that uh, fracking is a mistake, number one. And number two, it is because of the type of soils that we have here, um, water percolates very quickly and goes long distances versus uh, what you would find in a place like Iowa, for example. So, yes, it's a mistake. Yes, it's another poison that we're introducing. And um, I don't have real good data on it because it's out of our realm in terms of agriculture. We haven't had any um, impact where we are currently, but it's on our radar is what I can tell you. Yes, sir. I'm so grateful for your presentation to us this evening. I I'm wondering if you can tell us perhaps with statistics or some kind of maybe anecdotal evidence, the impact that college and university communities are having on the kind of sustainability that you introduce us to, especially perhaps to these students, so that they could participate in the larger positive energy that education is having. It is only anecdotal. I don't have any real data uh, that I can point to, but I will certainly work on that now because that is a great question and something that we should have good data on. There is no question about the fact that this generation is concerned and we still have this, we're still all in the same track. We get hungry.
and we have to eat. And we're, we're trapped by what is available. So we are seeing some college campuses asking for a shift to occur in the kind of food that they're being offered for the price that they pay to attend colleges and universities. It's not cheap to go to school. And so uh, wouldn't you expect to be fed well? And, and they do. And so we're seeing campuses change food services. We're seeing campuses adopting uh, growing food on campus by students. Uh, we're seeing campuses that are actually going into egg production because egg layers, chickens, are easy. And uh, in, indeed, that's the driver, is this generation right now. Uh, they have a concern. And we're, we're, that's why I'm here tonight. I, I never turned down this opportunity. Somebody else? Yep. Uh, when you went to Washington, how did they receive your findings, and are they making any changes in the agricultural policies to um, further this initiative? When I got to Washington, uh, first of all, before I went to Washington, I was in Baltimore in the convention center, and a woman walked up to me and handed me her business card, and she said, I hear you're coming to see us. And I looked at her card and she was from the USDA. So they knew, and we hadn't even really announced it. So somehow they caught wind of the fact that I was gonna make the walk. When we got to the USDA, they scheduled a two and a half hour meeting. I was really not up for two and a half hours after 16 days of walking, but I couldn't say no. They were very gracious and we were very grateful. Uh, I gave about a 20-minute presentation. Our chief scientists get, got into more of the deep science of our study, about 15 minutes. And then the rest of the meeting were USDA officials uh, actually presenting to us about the kinds of changes that are being made. Policy is not made by the USDA. It's made by Congress. And of course, they weren't in session when I got there. So we're planning another walk. If Alvernia would like to uh, put together a group and walk part way or walk a mile or walk all the way, you know, th those are the kinds of things that you, you guys can impact with. Here's what we plan on doing next year. I'm going to do the walk again, and we're going to involve all 50 states. We're going to have people walk to the state capitals in all 50 states. Um, it may just be a one-day walk, a 10-miler. And uh, we're going to coordinate so that all of those 50 states, those, those folks show up in their state capitals on the same day that I show up at the USDA. We think that will be even more impactful. Um, so, yes, uh, they were receptive. Policy is a whole different ballgame, and that's going to take a lot more work. But we certainly did have the ear of the USDA, and they, believe it or not, their director of climate change, I didn't even know they had a department, uh, but they have had a department of climate change since 1990. They don't do anything, but they do have a department. And their, and their director was there and he was nice enough to invite us back and continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. I know this is supposed to be a widespread sort of initiative. I'm curious how this is going to reach out to those who are already poor, the people that are already in poverty. How are they going to have the access to the organics when they already can't even afford the food they need in their daily lives? Part of what we do at the Rodale Institute is agree with you and agree with the fact that that segment of our society deserves better. It's called food justice. And so we have started programs to train new organic farmers and in particular they're trained to grow in urban areas and they're trained to feed people that don't have access to organic food. Currently, 
We have five farmers in our training program. So most of you have heard what a CSA is, Community Supported Agriculture. Those programs are set up for people that can put up $700 in a lump sum and pay a farmer in the winter time to have working capital. Our farmers are in a program that we call ASC, not CSA, ASC, Agriculture Supported Communities. And so we feed 185 families every week for 30 weeks in four different communities that don't have access to organic food and in some cases don't have access to grocery stores, period. I started a program down in Louisville, Kentucky. The people in that neighborhood bought their food at the liquor store. And we brought in farmers and created an ASC program to feed those people. So it's first steps. We are also able to take their SNAP card, what used to be called food stamps. We can take their assistance card, their government assistance card, swipe it, and hand them a big bag of organic vegetables. We charge $15 or $25 a week, and we're training other farmers. We recruit them from those same kinds of neighborhoods, from places that don't have access to that kind of food. Those are the people we recruit to our farm. They live with us, they live with us for eight months, and we train them to grow food in those same settings, and then we send them back to their homes to set up their own ASC business and create opportunity to stop that problem.
telling us today is pretty radical. It's a revolution, in fact, the roar. Um, and St. Francis was pretty radical. So I think a lot of us are excited about this and want to be part of this revolution. But organic food does seem pretty expensive when I go to the store. And I can buy one organic peach or maybe two that are on sale. Or I like to buy organic chicken when I can, but that Purdue Roaster is 99 cents a pound, and I can get three meals out of it. And so what are the steps that we can take to become radical? If, if going fully organic and what you say sounds very appealing, and it does, what are the small steps we can take to get to where we want to be, to, to be that change for the future? Well, I guess that I would tell you, I tell everybody, do something, do anything, but do something. It's when you all sit and go silent is when nothing changes. So make a change, and it doesn't matter what it is. One of those changes could be eat less chicken. Buy the organic and eat less. Grow your own organic food. That's another way to cut into cost very efficiently and effectively. Learn to grow your own. So I would be happy to come here, and here's a, here's a simple revolutionary step. I would be happy to come here and do a very intense assessment of what you have planted in grass that none of you eat, that you spend money on petroleum and labor to cut. And in the, in the heavy part of the season, it's you know cut multiple times a week sometimes. You're spending lots of money on a crop called grass that nobody ever eats. So why couldn't we come in and do an assessment and systematically, and not all at once, turn your campus into farmland or cropland, but systematically begin to convert turf into edibles, grown organically right here on campus, with uh, credits attached even. How revolutionary is that for Alvernia University to step out and say, not only are we going to teach you how to do it, we're going to give you credits to grow that food here, to put in the cafeteria and the dining halls here. There's a step that's easy and that the Rodeo Institute would be happy to step in and help you get started. So one more round of applause for Coach. 